this is our 27th annual conference that um, we have sponsored and we hope um, you will enjoy your day. The schedule is inside your, your uh, folder if you have not seen it yet. It also lists all of the, the um, breakout sessions. There will be two breakout sessions this afternoon. Um, and all of the breakout sessions are in the, in the main building down here. We will have people guiding you to, the, to those buildings um, this afternoon. I want to first um, sponsor, thank our sponsors, um, Kitsap County Commissioners, our Council for Human Rights, and then we have... Um, West Sound, Home and Garden, United Way, Paperbacks Plus, and I want to acknowledge Erica Hendricks for her work in putting together our programs. Um, we hope that um, we have a program to, that will inspire you and help, help us all work and move forward so that we can all be a caring, supportive, and safe community for all people. We want to celebrate individual differences and recognize the importance of every person's contribution to the community. And um, we, there is a note on the bottom of your uh, workshops it says views and opinions expressed by presenters or vendors are their own and do not necessarily uh, reflect those of Kitsap County or the Council for Human Rights or other sponsors. We we want to emphasize that we are nonpartisan and we want to make sure that no one is made to feel uncomfortable because of their views uh, that are expressed today. Our vision is for a safe community, and we hope that um, this is a very safe spot, space today that we can agree and disagree uh, very amiably. And um, so welcome. Thank you for being here. This is exciting. And um, we on the council are especially pleased with the weather. Uh, we were, after last year and having to reschedule because of snow, um, that kind of took a, a lot of precedence in our planning. And so we're thrilled that we're here today um, on Human Rights, Counts, uh, Human Rights Week. I would um, like to introduce some special guests today. And if you'll stand, uh, uh, Mayor Patty Lent of Bremerton is here. Um, we have Commissioner Charlotte Garrido in the back. Uh, we have Cheryl Nunez, who, ha who has been our, oh, but she's, she's hiding back here. Um, Cheryl Nunez has been our contact with OC who has, with, without uh, OC's sponsorship, we just could not have made this happen. And um, we, part of our mission is to educate the community, and so we love our partnership with Olympic College. And um, this feels like a very fitting place to be today. And um, Cheryl has helped us to make that happen. I also would like to introduce Shannon Turner, who is the student body president here at OC. Is there any other electeds that I missed? Okay, so um, I hope you will um, make everybody feel welcome. I want to introduce now the members of the Human Rights Commission. And 
Um, so if they'll come up here onto the stage. And the county commissioners at their December 4th meeting uh, passed a resolution for Human Rights Day. And um, so we're going to re read that. Read that. And first of all, um, I have Data Logan, who is our chair currently, Jeff Stelmack, Brandy Williams, Andrea Hendricks, and Marcy Mathis are with us today. And other members of our council are Rob Purser, Jeff Steele, Michael Ulig, um, Alice Gray has been helping with the um, registration table as well as Imelda Moore. And um, also uh, on our council is Tracy Flood, who we'll, we will see uh, later as we have our forum. So here's the Kitsap County Proclamation. <clears throat> this is a proclamation from the Kitsap County Board of Commissioners. Whereas on December 10th, 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, in 1950, invited all states to observe December 10th as Human Rights Day. And, Whereas the Universal Declaration recognizes the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family as a foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, and... Whereas the Universal Declaration asserts that all people shall enjoy the freedom of speech and belief, freedom from fear, and promotes the development of friendly relations between nations, and whereas the Kitsap County Board of Commissioners approved Resolution 4511994 on December 19th, 1994, to establish the purpose and function of the Kitsap County Council for Human Rights, and declaring that all people have the right to live in peace and harmony, to follow their beliefs, and to pursue their dreams without prejudice or discrimination, and that every resident of Kitsap County has the right to live in a safe, secure environment, free from harassment, harm, and intimidation. And? Whereas, to further recognize human rights in Kitsap County, the Board of Commissioners is co-sponsoring the 27th annual Kitsap County Conference for Human Rights to be held December 15th, 2017, which has the purpose to focus on awareness of and education about human rights. Now, there be it, therefore be it resolved, the Kitsap County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim December 10th, 2017 as Kitsap County Human Rights Day and December 10th through 16th, 2017 as Kitsap County Human Rights Week and encourages citizens to celebrate the ideals of freedom by teaching and promoting respect for human rights and equality. Adopted this fourth day of December, 2014. And it was signed by our commissioners, Charlotte Greedo, Robert Gelder, and Edward E. Wolf. Just a couple logistics. The restrooms are up the stairs or the ramp and around to the right in the hallway. Um, coffee and tea service will be out um, all morning and I believe uh, 
for a while after lunch as well. We have 12 groups that have signed up to be vendors today. And so I hope that um, during our brief breaks and in between sessions and at lunch that you'll be sure and stop by and see all of our vendors who have information for uh, different programs that are going on in Kitsap County. And, and we thank them for their interest and their efforts to be here today. And um, now I want to, uh, we got a bit of a late start, so I would just want to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker, Clarence Morawaki. And um, he has many, many accomplishments in this, in this uh, county helping us. He's the president of the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community. He has received the National Parks Conservation Association's highest accolade, the Conservationist of the Year, for his work in the, developing the memorial that is on Bainbridge Island for the Japanese internment a memorial. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's just beautiful, um, a very calming place. Um, he is the principal of Forest Edge Communications, has been the CEO of the Japanese Cultural and Community Center. He has been the spokesman for President Bill Clinton, Governor Mike Lowry, Congressman Jay Inslee, Governor John Cherberg, the Washington State Senate, Kitsap County Sound Transit, and the Portland Rose Festival. So he's been very, very, very busy um, as a, as a um, mother of an Eagle Scout. Perhaps one of the, the, the things that really caught my attention in his, his bio is that um, he was the state's first and youngest Eagle Scout, um, receiving that when he was 12. So um, you must have a fantastic mother, too. <laughs> that it, uh, my experience has been it's a full family uh, affair to reach Eagle Scout. And to, to do that at that young age is most commendable. So um, I'd like to introduce to you Clarence Murawaki. Uh, thanks very much. And one, one thing that she didn't mention that I'm really most proud of is uh, thank you for the award that the Kitsap County Council of Human Rights gave me in 2005 when you named me to your Wall of Fame award. Um, that was one of the biggest honors of my life. So I thank the, I thank the uh, council for that award. So a uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and we had a little snafu, so I'm going to have to do a little laptop dancing here going between the two. But as you can see, I hope you can see, if you can't see the uh, monitors or can't see the uh, projections, please move to a place where you can, because this is what the presentation's all about. And I promise that I'm not going to do this for you. I hope it's not torturous of what you're going to see in a moment. So my... <laughs> Everyone got the caption? That's good. All right. Catch up with me. Um, so this is really a simple project, and I call it the project of four H's. This is about history, honor, healing, and hope. And history has to be started here in Kitsap County. The first people who lived here were here for many, many millennia. And those are the Squamish and the, the tribe of Kitsap. And these pictures that you see on this image are of the Squamish in the 18th century. And the homes on the upper right were some of their beach houses on Eagle Harbor shore right where the city of Winslow is today. And the first Europeans arrived in 1792, and that was the voyage of English captain uh, George Vancouver in the HMS Discovery. And this is a picture of him anchoring off of Bainbridge Island. And in 1941, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Charles Wilkes came to the island and named it after his best friend, William, Commodore William Bainbridge. So what they found when they came here 
were these fantastic forests. This is a picture, I hope you can see the man in the corner in the lower part of this tree. This is um, not even the largest cedar that was on the island at that time. Remember, this was a virgin forest, so some of these trees were 1,000, 1,500 years old. They were gigantic. And so this was a huge resource that they wanted to exploit. And the largest lumber mill in the world was built on Blakely Harbor, which is, um, which is a harbor south of the uh, Eagle Harbor. And this is a picture of its second incarnation that burned down twice. And you can see in the distance that it also had the shipyard. And this was the Hall Brothers shipyard. So there was huge industry on Bainbridge Island. This big mill brought in people from all around the world, and the shipyard did as well. And at that time, it was the place, it was a total reverse of where it is today. People from Seattle and other places were commuting to Bainbridge Island to work. And Bainbridge Island had electricity first in Puget Sound before any other city, Tacoma, or any others. So it brought in a lot of people from all around the world. It brought in Swedes and Croatians and Norwegians and the Japanese and Filipinos. And the first census was done, but they found names like Mai, Moriwaki, or Ahayashita, hard to say or spell. So for many years, when the census came by, you were known as Jap number, whatever number you were at that time. The harbor was the place of major industry, and this is a map of Port Blakely in the late 19th century. And you can see where the Hall Brothers shipyard was in the upper north part of the harbor, as well as the mill, which would be near the mouth or where the end of the harbor is. And also, I want to really focus on the part that's in the lower left corner. And these are the two Japanese towns. There were more than 150. 150 men came over, and then they started bringing their families. So the men lived in Nagaya, which is the town closest in the upper part of the picture. They're, they'll be in the center of the picture. And then when their, the woman came and they started families, they created a town up the hill called Yama. Yama in Japanese means hill. You've often heard Mount Fuji, Fujiyama. That's what that means. And it became a very prosperous area of more than 300 people. This is a picture of Yama now. And uh, the Olympic College, as well as the State Archaeological Department, have been going over this site, trying to find the artifacts. It's the last and only untouched indigenous pioneer village of Japanese uh, in North America that we're aware of. And this was a vibrant, vibrant city. It had hotels. It had uh, restaurants, a uh, bathhouse. It had this man, uh, Mr. Takeyoshi, a very pr prosperous and enterprising entrepreneur. And he had many businesses, and not only his mercantile store, but a very popular ice cream parlor that everybody in the camp, I mean, everybody in the uh, harbor area went to go and enjoy their ice cream. And after the second, the third time, the second time the mill burned down, by this time all of the virgin old growth trees had been cut on the island, and so people had to find other things to do. So they started strawberry farming. Most Bainbridge Islanders did. In this picture, if anybody, if you know Bainbridge Island area, where these two men are standing is roughly where the Safeway is today. And where the end of the rows, you see where the strawberry rows are at the end, and then you see that empty field in the upper part, well, that is, that line there is Highway 305. And so this is, and because of their clearing, it was a lot of incredible hard work. Those giant stumps, some of those stumps were maybe, you know, 15 feet in diameter. They were huge. So they had to use dynamite from World War I surplus to clear it in horses, and they had to clear this land. And so they cleared this land, which also made the future development possible. It was not just strawberry farming. There were also other businesses. Anybody know about Bainbridge Island, um, the Bainbridge, Bainbridge Island Nursery? It's a wonderful place, and this is the store that was at the Bainbridge Island Nursery started by the Harui family. And they also had this wonderful garden there. It was the inspiration for the Bouchard Gardens, actually. <clears throat> Pardon me. Bouchard Gardens, as you know, is in Vancouver Island. They had a beautiful gardens as well, which had fountains and pathways through the woods. People would come from hundreds of miles around just to see the Bainbridge Island Gardens. So that was really, so there was a lot of enterprise, a lot of hard work by the Japanese-American immigrants. And our state was one of the first that had compulsory education. That meant every child, no matter who you were, had to go to school. So that brought these children together. And you can see in this picture all of the different ethnic groups going together, as well as what it was on Bainbridge Island. Bainbridge Island, you go, the um, Agate Pass Bridge did not come into place until 1951. So this was a closed ecosystem. 
you had to work together. You, there was only one hardware store you went to. So everybody worked together. It was an island of only about 3,200 people at the start of the war. There are about 3,600 students in the Bainbridge Island School District today. So it was a very, very tight community. Everybody worked together, got along together. And then history intervened on December 7, 1941, the Imperial Ar uh, Naval Forces came to the territory of Hawaii and bombed Pearl Harbor. On that day and the day after, FBI agents went through the entire country and they went without warrant. They wa walked in and they would take whatever they wanted. They had a list of contraband which included radios, cameras, the dynamite that they were given from World War I to clear stumps, any of their uh, rifles. And this is a picture of them going through the personal photo albums of one of the Bainbridge Island families. And this is a map of what they did. And this is a map, because you can see from the date, it is on December 9th, 1941. So in one day and a half, the FBI had gone through um, 22 cities, coast to coast, as well as the territory of Hawaii, and rounded up 1,212 Japanese leaders in the community. And they did it again without warrant, without search. Search warrants or anything in violation of the Fourth Amendment. And they were able to do this because many years before Pearl Harbor, at least until at least the mid-30s, maybe 1936, they had started a registry of everybody of 116th Japanese ancestry. And every time a Japanese American baby was born, they created a new file. It was really one of the first racial profiling events and uh, organized pro racial profiling events that have done in our American history. And since they had this file of everybody of 116th Japanese ancestry, they were able to go through the community so quickly. On February 4th, they came to Bainbridge Island, and with their data, they had, with the assistance, the FBI agents had the Kitsap County Sheriff's Department and Washington State Patrol officers come and hit all 50 homes on Bainbridge Island simultaneously because they did not want them to be tipped off. And again, they went through their homes and they arrested about 30 of the elders in the community and took them away to courts, took them away to prisons. So on February 19th, this is a couple months after Pearl Harbor, two months and about a week, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. And you hear a lot about executive orders these days and a lot of criticism about the previous administration and executive orders. And I'd like you to look at the number of that date right there. 75 years ago, there were more than 9,000 executive orders written by previous presidents. So this is not a new precedent. Um, I think we're in the 14,000 range right now. But I want you to look at the dates. I want you to look at December 7th, 1941 was when this attack happened. Two months and a week later, he signs his executive order. And then a month and a couple days later, the first civilian exclusion order was created. The executive order, a lot of people erroneously say that created the concentration camps. It did not. What the executive order did was give the War Department, now called the Department of Defense, complete authority to determine what was necessary for military security and security of the nation anywhere in the nation. And again, we had wars on both of, our, both of our shores, but they chose the West Coast, and the War Department Authority created exclusion zones. And so they were these. You can see in this map that line. You can see in Washington, it went from the Columbia River in eastern Washington north on Highway, I think it's called 75, to the Canadian border, all the way of eastern Oregon, all the, like past Mount Hood, all of California and southwestern Washington. If you're on the west side of this border, you see on this map, and of that 116th Japanese ancestry, you were going to be forcibly removed and excluded from this area. At that time, there was 114,000 people of that ancestry, or about 95% of all Japanese Americans on the continental United States. Another 6,000 would be born in the camps during the next three and a half years. So all told, 120,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated and moved, removed from their homes on, from this area on the West Coast. That exclusion order was on March 23rd, 1942. It gave them six days notice to get their act together. All the Bainbridge Islanders had to register with the War Department. They had to stay at curfews at eight o'clock. And then on March 30th that morning, they were going to be taken away. This historic picture was taken at the current Winslow Ferry Terminal location. The soldiers boarded and they went to the south side of the harbor to pick up the people that were going to be taken away to camps. If you didn't have your, someone to drive you to the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock or have someone get you there, the Army would give you free transportation in the form of troop carriers. And everybody had to go. This is a picture of Reverend Hirakawa 
the man on the right, he's 77 years old in this picture, and these are the orphans that were on Bainbridge Island. And this is a family, this is another picture, this is the uh, Moji family. They were a couple, he was in his 50s, she was in her 40s, and they never had children. Um, no one knows why, whether it was by choice or they were unable to, but they always had a wonderful pet dog, and their pet dog was named King, and everybody knew King because he was a white Samoya dog, which even today is pretty unusual. And everybody loved King, and King was basically their child, and he jumped into the truck and refused to get out. The soldiers had to wrestle him out and restrain King, trying to chase the truck while they were taken away. Um, King was left with another family to be uh, cared for while the Mojis were gone, but King was so despondent that he refused to eat and drink, and he died about a week and a half later. This is a picture of Fumiko Hayashida, a very iconic photograph. She is 31 years old in this picture. She is holding her bare, not even one-year-old daughter, Natalie, and she is pregnant with her third, Leonard, who would then be the first baby born in Manzanar. This picture was taken by the Seattle PI, which, by the way, since they were the first forced removal, the Seattle Post Intelligence or paper came and photographed this with high-quality photographers. That's why we have on Bainbridge Island probably the best photographic record of any forced removal because the newspaper covered it. That's why you see all these iconic photographs. And I'll talk about her in a minute because she's played a remarkable role in this history. In that time when those soldiers came from New Jersey, they came on March 23rd, you saw that picture where they posted those things. I should have mentioned that one of the Army's efforts was to try to integrate themselves in the community. These New Jersey soldiers came all the way across the country to put those posters up. One of their requirements was to reach out and they thought, said, we're going to go to the high school and ask the high school to send your student body leader and your football captain and stuff to show us where are the best locations to put up the posters. All of the three young men that came were all Japanese American seniors at the school. And they got to know the people really well. These, these New Jersey soldiers really integrated themselves into the community. You can see on this picture here, demonstrated that they held their, their you can see on other pictures, they're carrying the suitcases, they are holding the children. And I should mention that all the people could only take what they could carry or wear, so that everybody wore layers of clothing. They had their summer clothes underneath their fall clothes, underneath their winter clothes, and because they can only have one suitcase. Some of those suitcases were just for the, their children's clothing. And so here's that morning. You can see people assembling. This is the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock, the south side of Eagle Harbor. You can see the cars gathered. You can see the soldiers assembled in the front marching down. And here's a picture of them marching down to the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock. On that morning, 227 people boarded the ferry. It was 11 o'clock in the morning when the ferry arrived at the dock. They boarded around 11.20. And then they... We're going across the harbor. This is Sumiko Kurafura saying goodbye to Bainbridge Island, and then they arrived in Seattle. To trains, you can see the people. There were thousands of people there watching them. And also look at the train. Uh, they were excited to get on Many people had never been on a train before. But they boarded the train. Um, they said goodbye. They went on this train for three days and two nights with the window blinds shut the entire way. They got to a high, hot desert in, in Owens Valley, which is in California. They had to ride a bus for another two hours, and then they arrived here. This is the Manzanar concentration camp. This picture was taken a day after they arrived on April 2nd. They arrived on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1942, and these barracks were being assembled by Japanese Americans from Terminal Island in uh, from the Los Angeles area. Now, these barracks were about 100 feet long by 25 feet 100 feet by 20, and they were broken up into four apartments, basically. So they were about 20 by 25 feet. The walls did not go all the way to the ceiling. There was no insulation. They were just bare wood walls with tar paper on the outside. This is a typical barracks area. All you had were the cots, a stove, a wood stove, or an oil stove, and one bare light bulb. And when you arrived, Everybody got one large canvas sack and one small canvas sack and were told to go to a large pile of hay, fill up both of these sacks. The large one would serve as your mattress and the small one would be your pillow. People made the best of what they could do with the area. Here's a picture of the bachelor's areas and you can see how they tried to put their possessions on the walls and whatnot and hung their laundry up. 
this is a map or a model of the Manzanar concentration camp that you can find at the Japanese National American Museum in Los Angeles. At its peak, there was about 10,000 people there. You can see the barracks are assembled up in blocks. They're centered around. Um, there are 504 barracks at this place, and there are 36 blocks. Here's a map of what that actually was at that time. In the middle of each barrack was one large barrack, which served as the mess hall, and another one that served as latrines. The latrines didn't have any partitions. They didn't have any uh, privacy, and also the showers are open. Uh, this was a huge shock for a lot of the people, especially the elders of the Japanese background, because they prided themselves in their modesty and their privacy, so having to do this in front of total, complete strangers was, was really difficult. There were people who went through their entire three and a half years who only went to the latrines at two in the morning because they didn't want to be around other people. And the, bar and the mess hall eating situation. Everybody had to eat together in these, in these uh, mess hall situations, and that was a big cultural shock as well because the Japanese-American families always had their meals together. And this started breaking up the family units in these camps because the kids had a lot of freedom. It's interesting when I talk to people of this era. Now, there's 120,000 stories out there, so there is not one specific story that would be as broad brushing as any kind of uh, broad stereotyping. But generally speaking, when you talk to people, especially if they were adolescents and, or teenagers during their times in the camp, many of them will tell you, this was the greatest time of my life. And I said, but you were behind barbed wire in a concentration camp. How could that possibly be good? They said, well, we, we didn't have to work on the farms all the time, and, and we didn't have to work in the store, you know, and it was, you know, and depending on your orientation, I never saw so many cute Japanese boys or girls in my life. And the parents helped make that possible. They helped make it be possible for them to have normal lives. They, so they had schools, they converted certain barracks into schools, and they made sure there were all these activities, they made dances. You can see they decorated the barracks into a dance hall. Um, they had jazz bands, they had art and sports. The, these are girls playing basketball out on the court. And baseball was huge. Baseball was a big activity. Every single one of the main 10 concentration camps built baseball diamonds, built baseball fields because they love baseball. But it was also a symbol of saying, we are Americans and we are part of this American pastime and we're American citizens. And so here it is at Manzanar and you can see the thousands of people rounded up watching this baseball game. Here's a picture taken of that same area. That clearing off in the, in the middle right is that baseball picture you just saw. All of these pictures you just saw, except for the toilets, were taken by Ansel Adams, a naturalist. He was a wonderful photographer who was known mostly for his black and white images of natural landscapes and parks around the country. But he was commissioned by the War Relocation Authority to take essentially propaganda pictures of the camps, to take people looking, playing basketball and having dances and all the things you just saw. But he was also, he could not take pictures of the guard towers. He could not take pictures of the barbed wire. He could not take pictures of soldiers with their bayonets or guns because that was not what the, the, the national narrative wanted it to be. But he did one thing in this picture that you can notice. You notice this picture has an elevated perspective. You know, Ansel Adams is not 80 feet tall. He was taking the picture from a guard tower. But someone did take a picture of the guard tower, and this picture is taken by Toyo Miyataki. Toyo Miyataki was a Los Angeles well-known portrait and naturalist photographer. And cameras, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the contraband that the government would, would take from you when they searched your homes. He wanted to document this, so what he did was he took apart a camera, or several cameras, took apart the lenses, the film winding mechanism, and all the rest, stuck them in the bottoms of his shoes and his socks and everywhere in his luggage. When he got to the camp, he then made a box that assembled the camera parts. And like Shawshank Redemption, he dug out a, a, a dark room underneath the barracks. So he basically made a room underneath the barracks, crawled underneath the barracks, and had this dark room. He did this all. And, and then it's amazing, he could order, everybody ordered stuff from the Sears and Roebuck catalog and the Montgomery Wards catalog, their clothing and, and all that stuff. And he was ordering photographic supplies. It was amazing. The military never looked at it. It came in black boxes. But he took these pictures. He also took that picture of the latrines because Ansel Adams or no one could do that. And so that's why there's wonderful photographic evidence of this. But if you look at the daring part of this picture, 
look at the perspective of the picture. He calls it three boys behind barbed wire. You can see the guard tower in the distance. But he's also threatening or possibly going to get shot because he's on the outside of the fence. People wanted to show their patriotism in different ways. And so when the war was really at its peak, we lost more than 500,000 lives in, in the war, uh, in World War II. So, so many men were needed to fight in the war. So they then went and asked, went to the camps and after a year or so asked, would you enlist in the war? And then there was later a draft. From Bainbridge Island, out of the 276 Japanese Americans who were forcibly removed and excluded from the island, 68, 66 men and two women were either in, enlisted or were drafted into the military to serve in, for the United States. This is a picture of Art and Flo Kura. He also served in the venerable 442nd Regimental Combat Team. For those who don't know about it, it is an all-segregated Japanese-American unit that fought in the European theater. And for military history, for a unit of its size and duration, it has a new, the most decorations, the most Medal of Honors, the most casualties per capita of any unit of any size and any type. They really, and Flo Kerr was one of those people who fought with the 442nd. This is a picture of him taking off on the train. There was also a unit called the Military Intelligence Service, which were linguists, bilingual uh, soldiers who fought in the Pacific Theater against the Japanese and then in the occupation. My father served in the Military Intelligence Service in World War II and served in the occupation of Japan. So this is how some people wanted to show their patriotism of how we're loyal Americans. There were also other people who had different thoughts on how to protest that. And look at these three men, Gordon Hirabayashi, Fred Korematsu, and Norman Yasui. These three men wanted to show their patriotism in a different way. Each of these three men challenged the constitutionality of President Roosevelt's executive order 9066 and all of the exclusion orders as unconstitutional because they were US citizens. And they did it all in different ways um, I'll talk about Mr. Uh, uh, Norman Yasui refused to serve in the military. Uh, Fred Korematsu refused to register for the draft. Gordon Hirabayashi, he refused to uh, abide with curfew. And I got to know him very well because he was a University of Washington student and then supported our memorial 20 years ago when we first got started. And his story is really kind of hilarious. He said, I'm going to violate the curfew. He's a student at the University of Washington and he kept going up to the cops. Look, it's past 8 o'clock. You got to arrest me. And they kept saying, go home, Gordon. Stop it. Knock it off. So they finally said, okay, we're going to arrest you. He was arrested by the King County sheriffs. They put him in prison there and then he was convicted of violating the curfew. But this was during the war. This was in 42. And so he couldn't get, a, he was going to go to prison in Arizona. That's where the federal prison where he was assigned to be incarcerated. But there were no available buses for him because this was wartime. Gas cards were rationed, so even if he had a car, he couldn't get gas. So Gordon had to hitchhike to Arizona <laughs> to go to prison. And then when he got there, the people didn't believe he had to be there. He had all these papers, so he hung around in, in the town in Arizona for like a week before he fi they finally put him into prison, finally let him in, because he didn't believe the order. So these guys, though, are so amazing because not only had the country turned their backs on everybody who looked like me or them, but when they did this, when they were challenging the constitutionality of these orders and they all went to the US Supreme Court and all of their convictions were upheld. So they found that the executive orders in World War II were constitutional. But they were going against the grain culturally as well as nationally in their, in their communities and people were saying to them, stop it. Stop rocking the boat. You're making us look disloyal. So the community turned their backs on them. They were really free men on islands, really, to themselves. It was incredibly courageous for them to do that because they really, they really believed in the Constitution that they had no right to have this take, their rights taken away from them. And we were also at war, with not with just Japan, but the other Axis forces, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. But there were no civilian exclusion orders for anybody of Italian ancestry or German ancestry. And there were about 10,000 arrests of people of German and Italian ancestry, but all of these people were German nationals or people who were suspected of doing something. And every one of these 10,000 people who were arrested who were German or Italian nationals were either suspected of, 
charged with or convicted of some sort of crime of espionage, disloyalty, or some sort of effort against the, the security and safety of the United States. Not one person out of those 120,000 people was even charged with a crime, let alone convicted of one. But this was done against the Japanese Americans, and there's probably good reasons for it, because there were about 14 million German and Italian nationals in the, in the entire United States. We still don't have a city that large in the United States. So how could you possibly do that? And it would have also been very problematic for an Italian-American like Joe DiMaggio, who Marilyn Monroe would probably have to find her first different husband. And the incarceration of German-Americans like Dwight Eisenhower, who would not have been able to lead the Allied forces to victory and become a Republican U.S. president. So I've said earlier that this were con unconstitutional acts. And here are two of the first ten amendments, of which, by the way, um, today is the anniversary of the signing of the Bill of Rights. Um, the, for the Fourth Amendment is obvious. Th this is the provision that says you must have a search warrant, that everybody is secure in your persons, your property, your life, and the government obviously took all that away. The Fifth Amendment, you can read it for yourself, but it is so powerful. I've talked to many different people who are constitutional scholars or look at other governments in other countries, and to their knowledge, we are the only country that says persons. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. All the other constitutions or you know, governing documents say citizens. And this is extraordinary for a couple of reasons. One, the men who wrote this were, were white male property owners who, even if you were a white male, you couldn't vote if you didn't own property. And some of their property were black slaves. But they said this, they put this out forward, and, it, and all these Japanese Americans are obviously persons. They were obviously persons who were getting this right taken away from them. And at that time, J. Edgar Hoover, who I mentioned earlier, was the head of the FBI, and he had been surveilling the entire Japanese American community with profiles on everybody who was 116 Japanese American. He said, Mr. President, I've got nothing. I've got no hint of espionage of any of these people. He was more worried about the German Bund having Charlottesville-style rallies up and down Manhattan with their flags and, and swastikas. Um, and then his Attorney General Biddle told President Roosevelt, Mr. Roosevelt, two-thirds of these people are U.S. citizens under the 14th Amendment. They were born here. You are not going to be able to pass constitutional muster with this executive order because these are citizens. You will have 75,000 lawsuits. And so what the government did to get around that, with just a stroke of a pen, created a new subclassification for all these Japanese American citizens. And they were no longer Japanese American citizens or American citizens. They were called non-aliens. And this new non-alien classification was then, because Roosevelt signed the order, allowed the Supreme Court to uphold his executive order. Because clearly the 14th Amendment is a violation of that. Everyone knows this phrase, and you've seen it before. And we swore that you got to learn from your lessons. And the mans in our concentration camp, where the Bainbridge Islands were the first ones to go there, you'll see this thing when you walk into, this beautiful display when you walk into their interpretive center. And I hope you can read that phrase, but the phrase in the upper right with the um, picture of the Arizona being sunk on December 7th in Pearl Harbor, on top of the image of the falling of the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. The quote in the upper right corner reads, they that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. That's Benjamin Franklin. So did we learn from our past history mistakes? This is very typical of what happened to the common thread of, of what people felt about the war with Japan. And this is what happened after September 11th. In World War I, the Germans had became masters of propaganda, very hateful propaganda. They found a way to really mobilize their troops by demonizing the enemy, making them appear less human. Uh, you have to do that. You have, you have to do something to motivate people to do these acts of violence that they normally wouldn't do. 
And we as a government said we wouldn't do that. And here are some examples of what those, the Germans did. The, the translation of this, you can see the dark man in the corner and he's threatening the German woman holding her infant child with her other child in the foreground. Here's Great Britain invading um, Europe, coming toward Germany. And, and it's hard to make out in this picture, but in the background, attached to the spider, is a thread, and Uncle Sam is on the horizon. We swore we would never stoop to this level, right? These images that you'll see, all of these posters were taxpayer-funded posters by whatever government authority, whether it was the War Department, the Treasury, or whatever. And after September 11th, the close. This is a depiction of Muhammad, the spiritual leader of the Islamic faith. Of course, most of you know that Mecca is the place where people of the Islamic faith, month, once in their life, must make a pilgrimage, and there's millions that show up. Millions of people are millions of people are represented in this photograph. little backstory on this. I was a voracious kid. I, I knew I learned how to read when I was three and a half years old and I loved these Dr. Seuss books but they were kind of expensive then and uh, my friends had them and I wanted them and my mother got a part-time job so she could raise some money to get me one as a Christmas present I think when I was four or five. It was red, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And my father just, I remember my father and her having arguments and fighting about it. And I thought it was because he thought it was just wasteful spending. Um, when I got to college and saw this, I understood why my father wasn't a big fan of Dr. Seuss. Now, these were promoted by a lot of different groups, not just governmental groups, but private organizations, businesses, as tokens, as, as, a, as, a, as a prize, if you will. And... The bottom of this, this print reads, this permit may be used in conjunction with permit number 38, mosque destruction. Please give 24 hours notice to the local fire departments prior to deconstruction. This is one given out by the US government to Marines from their superior officers after they pass their marksmanship accreditation classes. And it says, is hereby authorized to observe open season on all Japanese wherever contacted. This license carries no bag limit and may be used to good advantage during blackout hours. Hot lead leaves them dead. I quote that because on the items in the war and theater, when you're in the fighting, there are no blackout hours in combat. The blackout hours refer to the curfew and the shutdown of all lights and businesses on the coast, coastal cities like Los Angeles, Seattle, San Diego, because there was a fear that the Japanese could spot the city from the from the shores, so blackout hours meant everybody had to turn their lights off, everybody had to, they had tape over the headlights of cars. Blackout hours referred to civilian situations. This was a fundraising appeal in 2016 for a candidate for governor. Uh, $10 got you this bumper sticker, and uh, he raised tens of thousands of dollars from this uh, fundraising appeal and he is now the governor of Missouri. This was a very, you know, George Washington University is a very popular and, and very progressive uh, liberal university and this was a rally about a month after September 11th on October 16th to 22nd, uh, 2001. So, you see all this stuff happening and people held it in for a long time and in 19, um, 1976, 1980, 1980, the final year of President Carter's uh, term, he said, I want to look into this. And he created a bipartisan commission uh, called the uh, Wartime Relocation of Interments and uh, of Interment and Civilians. And they brought together historical scholars and legal experts 
to look after, look through all of the documents and records at that time to determine what was the motivation. Was there really a necessary need for national security, or were there evidence of espionage, or what really was the story behind this? Was it justified? It took them two and a half years to finish the report, and under the Reagan administration, this was their unanimous decision. It was none of that, but it was based on these three things, racial prejudice, war hysteria, and a lack of political leadership. And I would just suggest to you that after September 11, 2001, we can throw in religious intolerance. So what our project is all about is honor. And that's Bainbridge Island. It's a unique, unique place. These people played a huge role in what made Bainbridge Island a place of honor. This is the picture of the new publishers of the review. They were in their 40s. Or, yeah, they were in their 30s, actually. They bought the newspaper in 1941, just about a half year before Pearl Harbor. This was his dream. He was a Seattle uh, Times reporter, and they're going to do this little newspaper on Bainbridge Island. And he, on that day, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, like a lot of other newspapers, worked that day, put out a special edition for the next day, and on December 8th, their editorial said, let's not have mob rule, there's no evidence of disloyalty, these are our friends and neighbor, let's keep our heads calm. When Roosevelt signed his executive order, he blistered the president, saying, have you not read the Bill of Rights, Mr. President? These are American citizens. And he, during the war, had people write back from the camps. He kept people informed. And he's the only newspaper editor to do all of that through the war. There were some newspapers who editorialized caution at the beginning of the war. But as the war grew on and the horrors of the deaths and carnage happened, they quickly dropped off and went with the drumbeat of the administration. But Woodward didn't have any part of it. He said this was a violation of Japanese Americans, and he stood out. He also made sure that everybody had the equal voice. This is not a Pollyanna thing with him. So there were people on Bainbridge Island who certainly thought it was a good idea for the Japanese to be moved away. One person in particular named Schuyler created a pamphlet said the Japs must not come back when the war is over. So he would print any letter as long as it wasn't libelous. And he had, it wasn't fake news to him. He was a real journalist. And because of that, he created this atmosphere of security and safety for the Japanese Americans, as well as, more importantly, the people on Bainbridge Island knew what was happening to their friends and neighbors because he had someone write back every week telling the stories of who got married, who went to, who went to war, who got injured in a softball game, who passed away. So the camp or everybody knew exactly what was happening to their friends and neighbors behind barbed wire constantly throughout the war. And he helped create that incredible atmosphere of support and his daughter wrote this book and it's a fabulous book it's in universities and schools and libraries all around the country and i hope you get a chance to read it. it's a wonderful chronicling of their history this is a picture again of fumiko hayashia do you see her in the corner there she is holding that picture that is her and her daughter natalie now 72 and in this picture and this is when they came to open up the wall and dedicate the memorial wall on bainbridge island in 2011 and the picture on the upper right is them standing in the front of their original farmhouse, which still is on Bainbridge Island. And she was so brave, she went to testify before Congress. And I had to urge her to go. She was 95 years old in, the, in this picture. And she refused to go, and I said, you have to go. We have to have this memorial work. Our Congressman Jay Inslee was a sponsor of the bill and requested her to come. And after an hour of convincing her, she said, well, I'll do it. You have to do two things for me. And of course, I'm going to do whatever, two things. That's got to be easy. She said, you tell me what to say and you go with me. And so I had the privilege to interview her and write her testimony and then go with her to Congress. And, you know, it's not like TV. Most congressional hearings, our people are looking at their blackberries. You know, they're, they're reading the newspaper. They're not paying attention. They're just waiting for their one bill. It isn't like a Supreme Court hearing where everybody's sitting and paying capt attention. But when I brought her in on a wheelchair, everybody stopped. Everybody put down their pens, their smartphones, even the Congress, congressional members up on the dais all stopped. And you, you could hear the squeaking of the wheelchair as I brought her to the mic. Because they were, living, they were seeing and witnessing living history. And that honor was amazing. And, it's, and it really swung the day. And I'll tell you this, when we did our bill, we had unanimous votes every time. Of course, the Kitsap County Commissioners supported us and the Bainbridge Island City Council, but our state legislature, both chambers, 
And when this bill came up for a vote, it was a unanimous vote. This is not science fiction, guys. This is red, blue, urban, rural, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat. All of them supported this bill, which is res remarkable when you think 75 years ago it was the opposite. 75 years ago it was a unanimous voice supporting the president. Not one member of Congress opposed the executive order. Not one. And in our state, by the way, our state, Oregon, California, the governors, cities that we think are very liberal today, Seattle, San Francisco, Portland, and every city in between except for Bainbridge Island, all of these cities who took a stand either wrote official proclamation statements or laws unanimously passing saying that when the war is over, you Japanese, or sometimes just Japs are not welcome to come back to fill in the blank of your city, state, or county. It was very remarkable. And so her testimony really was powerful. And here is her on the day of dedication of the Memorial Wall on August 9, 2011, getting a hug from one of her seven great-grandchildren. And because of that passage, we are now a satellite unit of the Minidoka National Historic Site, National Historic Site here on Bainbridge Island. So this site was done for this important reason. We wanted to heal these wounds for these people to, who suffered through this indignity to feel like their country honored them. So here's a, here's a picture of them marching down to the ferry on March 30th, 1942. And we built the site exactly on the path where they marched down to the ferry. And if you've ever been there, here's, it's on the south side of Eagle Harbor. You can see in this map, there's the Winslow Ferry Terminal on the north side, and the red dot represents where the old Eagle Dale Ferry Dock was, where the memorial is located. And when you arrive at the memorial, you see this beautiful Alaskan yellow cedar pavilion, which around it has some interpretive displays, which are going to have some new ones. We're going to have some new ones installed in February by the National Park Service. So put these in your memory because these little images are going to be soon history. You turn around from the pavilion, now you go walk down to where the wall is. The wall is built exactly on where they marched down to the ferry. You take a gravel path, you come across a wooden footbridge over a wetland, underneath an entry gate, and you come to the wall. That material there is granite. We picked granite specifically because Granite is the bedrock geology of the western United States. Anybody who's been to Yosemite know that half dome and all those structures are just one gigantic granite uplift. So it's just not only representing that geology, but it represented the bedrock of the community of Bainbridge Island, of which these Japanese Americans had so much solid support. And this is our model, Nidoto Nayoni, let it not happen again. So you turn around from the wall and from the top of the wall all the way to the end of it that you can see there, that's 276 feet. That's one foot for every Japanese American who lived on Bainbridge Island at the start of the wall. And many people ask us, why is it curved? And I say, because it looks cool. <laughs> but in reality, what we really wanted it to be was, it is, a, it is a much more interesting look, of course, I hope you agree. But we wanted this to represent their time of passage on Bainbridge Island, of immigration establishment, their forced removal, their return. And time is not linear. Time takes twists and turns. We all have had that happen in our lives. I mean, if time had gone exactly the way I thought it would be when I was 10 years old, I would be the first Japanese American astronaut, US Senator, Oscar winning movie star. So <laughs> it didn't work out that way. So you walk down the wall and you come to this panel and it says in part, this wall marks the path where on March 30th, 1942, Bainbridge Islanders of Japanese ancestry, Nikkei, walked, suitcases in hand, to be carried by a ferry far away from their homes to an uncertain future, some never to return. One thing that we wanted to make sure we did on this wall was to honor all of those 276 individuals. So they're grouped by family and their age. And this is, you can see in this one, this is Fumiko Hayashida, the woman that went to testify before Congress. Um, she eventually died in 20, 20, she was 103 when she finally passed away just four years ago. And you can see her name with her family and their ages. And the things on the bottom there, those are little plastic frogs. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. Um, little plastic frogs from eight of her uh, grandchildren who honored her because her most favorite thing was frogs. She had the world's biggest frog collection. 
This is the first panel. And on this image over his right shoulder, or his left shoulder, it reads, I came to Bainbridge Island in 1908. Bainbridge was a good place to raise a family. Tomokichi Nishinaka. You walk further down the wall a little bit, and you come to this image. And over on the left side of this image, above the American flag and the depiction of Bainbridge Island High School, the quotation reads, I was born and raised on Bainbridge Island, and I'm a 100% American citizen. We will protect our flag, the United States flag, Masaki John Nakata. And above his baseball glove, the other quotation reads, just a week before we were to leave, Coach Pop Miller put in all of the Japanese American players. Despite errors and not hitting, he let us play the whole game. We lost 15 to 2. Walks further down the wall, you come to the next panel. And above the image of the crane on the left, the quotation reads, I felt like a second class citizen to be herded onto the boat by soldiers with bayonets. It was the most humiliating experience of my life. The Sami Nakao. And underneath the tire of the troop transport truck, that quotation reads, we were really careful. We were prisoners, and they had guns with spears. That's Fumiko Nishinaka Hayashida, the woman who testified before Congress. Walk further down the wall, and while all these images are great, this is my personal favorite. It's the only image that is three-dimensional because it has barbed wire in front. It's actual barbed wire that this woman has to peer through. And the quotation to her right shoulder underneath the guard tower reads, the searchlights played on our windows back and forth all night. I couldn't sleep. The Sami Nakao. And on her left shoulder, uh, by the barracks, the quotation is, back home at graduation, they had 13 empty chairs on the stage. That day I felt so empty and sad. I sat on my bunk and I cried. Nobuku Sakai Omoto. You come further down the wall, and this is the part where I get to after I give a tour of the site, this is the part where I ask the tour group, um, are you smarter than a fifth grader question? And ask them, why is there a break in the wall here? And this break in the wall is simply because for, this is a story about Japanese Americans on Bainbridge Island and that wall represents that. That's why that old growth red cedar wall is on top of the solid granite foundation of the community. But for three and a half years, they are not on Bainbridge Island, so that's why there's no wall. And this depicts the loss of the Japanese Americans on the island. But you notice in the middle there, you see that dark monolith. You can't really see it in these pictures, but that's basalt. Basalt is volcanic rock. And in eastern Washington and southern Idaho, it's a lot like uh, Hawaii is. That they had fissure basalt. It just oozed out. It wasn't a volcanic eruption. It oozed out for centuries. And a lot of it pocketed. And it got all these nice air pockets, so it's really bubbly. And this is the kind of stone that you find at Minidoka. And the, all, the, all the camps, all of the barracks and such are gone. The only structures that are there are the sturdy ones. And in this case, the chimney of the guardhouse and the foundations of that entry guardhouse at Minidoka. You go there now, and that, that, that um, basalt is still there. And so that's what this represents, that dark time in Minidoka. And a fifth grader, we'd had this wall up for three years. And in 2014, some fifth grader playing really close attention, remembering what I said about the granite and then the the Minidoka basalt, not from this region. She says, I understand why you picked that rock. I said, oh, well, tell me, what do you think? And she said, that rock's here, that represents that rock doesn't belong here, just like the Japanese didn't belong in the camps. So this is our last panel. And you come up to this, one of these, this quotation here. And on this, it part, and reads in part, Nidoto Nayoni, 276 Bainbridge Island residents whose lives were dramatically changed by a troubling chapter in American history. Let it not happen again that a group of people are singled out, that their loyalty and patriotism be questioned because of their race or ancestry. Nidoto Nayoni. And this is the final panel. You notice it's big. It's three panels. This is deliberate. We wanted the last panel to be the largest and the brightest. You'll notice that it's in full color. All of the other panels were relatively monochromatic. We wanted this to be bright. We wanted this to be when your last thing you see at the site, this, this hopeful thing, because their friends and neighbors looked after them. They looked after their properties. They welcomed them home. And the first panel, uh, underneath the crane flying, the quotation reads, 
I was kind of afraid, but the neighbor girl that I used to play with came up and welcomed me. Ikkyo Suimatsu Shibiyama. The next panel shows that one of the people welcoming them back, and underneath her arm, the quotation reads, we put the farm under Mr. Raber's name while we were gone. When we came back, he returned it to us, Naburakura. And it was more than that. The Rabers bought the farm for a buck, and it gave title. They made sure all the taxes were paid, they looked after the property, and actually collected some and tried to do the, the harvest the best they could. When they came back, they had a shoebox with a little windfall of money, and they got to buy it back for the same dollar. The last panel here above the image of the ferry boat in the harbor reads, My father and his brother worked so hard to build up Bainbridge Gardens. When we returned here, there was nothing left. It must have broken him, Junko Harui. We deliberately picked that phrase because, yes, so many people came back. 150 out of the 276 did come back. It's the highest percentage anywhere, any county, any state, any city. Most weren't, didn't come back at all because there were vigilante gangs torching their homes. And actually more might have come back had they been able to buy property. You could not buy property if you were not a U.S. citizen. That was an alien land law. It was a racist act in 1924. And these first generation Japanese Americans who wanted to be citizens couldn't even apply for citizenship until 1951. So how could they buy property? We had a lot of two-year-old landlords on Bainbridge Island. The children were U.S. citizens, so they bought property in their names. And there's probably another 50 people who had farmland, but they could, either couldn't buy it or didn't have the money or they didn't have children to put their names under it to buy the property. Or else we would have had well over 200 out of the 276 return. So Bainbridge was really special. But in this case, Bainbridge Gardens was not so lucky. People went to Bainbridge Gardens and looted their property. They took fountains, they took plants, they took, you know, gardening supplies, whatever. And Junko Harui told me when he came back from the incarceration, came back to Bainbridge Island, his father would drive around the island and point, well, that's my tree, that's my shrub, that's my fountain. So there was some stuff going on there. So when you finish the tour of the wall, you turn around, you go through the exit gate, you walk back what we call the contemplative return path, come over a small grove of cedars, you return here, go across again a bridge to the other part of the wetland, and then you return to the pavilion. Now we have future plans for the site. One is underway right now. We are designing what we call the exclusion departure deck. It will be as if you cut off the first 50 feet of the old Eagle Dale Ferry dock, kind of leave it over the water. So we want people to actually have to leave the island. It's going to be a very evocative deck because it'll be a wooden deck with railing on both sides, but the end of it will not have a railing, wood railing. It'll have a wire railing. So from a distance, you could see that picture at the beginning when you looked all the way down the wall to the end. Imagine this deck sticking out at the end, but it looks like you're going to fall off the cliff into the harbor. It looks as if it literally got cut off. We got to want that. I got a grant that's going to pay for two-thirds of it from the National Park Service and right in the middle of design and permitting as we speak. And also the long-term plan is to build a visitor center and outdoor gathering area. You can see in this drawing on the right side is the pavilion that is existing there. We'll have next to it a small amphitheater that can seat about 60 people for outdoor presentations and then a, a green roof building, a thousand square foot timber frame building. This plaza will be paved. You can see the bench at the end which also will serve as kind of a wall that closes off the area from the rest of the site. We're shooting for LEED Gold, that's an environmental uh, building standard, have a green roof, and will also be timber frame to speak to the timber frame structures like the wall, the gates, and the pavilion that are there. So this whole project, and this whole story is this last word. Hope is what we want people to learn from this. The Dota Nayoni is a call to action. Let it not happen again. We want people to be inspired to live up to the ideals of our pledge. This is the Pledge of Allegiance as it was in 1942. Under God was not added until 1954. And on the bottom of this poster, the quote reads, I wonder who the next exception will be. And the quote, if this democracy, with her extraordinary constitution, could imprison people only because of their ethnic background, 
It could happen again. And it could happen to anyone, black, brown, yellow, or white. It's a quote from Senator Daniel K. Inouye. He was the first Japanese American U.S. Senator from the state of Hawaii. He fought in that 442nd Regimental Combat Team that I mentioned earlier that fought in Europe. He literally left his left arm in Italy for our country. And he also won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Our project is this. This is Dr. Frank Kitamoto, who was our president prior to me, he, me becoming president. He was our president for more than a quarter century. Really miss him. He was, he was really a powerful man. And, and it wasn't because he was big or, you know, looked like Vin Diesel. He was powerful because of conviction and strength of his, his moral authority. And this is the message we hope everybody leaves with. And when I talk to school kids, you know, we try to tell our children, don't be afraid, be brave. And I would say, fear is a good thing. Fear is something that we have to have. Because you see these wildfires in California, or the hurricanes that hit, you know, the, the Texas and, and uh, Puerto Rico and all the rest. When fear happens, what happens? We are animals. And fear causes your adrenaline to boost. And you can run faster. And your awareness, your senses are more aware than ever to protect you from a real fear, to protect you and your life. You, this fear is something that you really must not be afraid of because it can be something that can save your life. But as Roosevelt said, ironically, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Like that fear that charges up our body and gets up in that high hyper state, you can't stay at that state forever. The adrenaline, your body can't take that kind of anxiety and stress. And in today, we, in our body politic, in our country, Manufactured fear is giving us that anxiety. There's real fear and manufactured fear of what you saw in all those posters I, saw, I showed you and the rest. We cannot allow manufactured fear to set public policy. We can't allow manufactured fear to set a national discourse that puts us one against another. We are supposed to be a United States of America, not a divided States of America. And we're living in an era right now that's all about that. And that is not the way I think of America. That is the opposite of love. And we should be a loving country, not a country that disperses hate and division and fear. That is why we have this motto. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, I was glad to see that many of you got to take a look at the various vendor booths and got information of things going on. It is my pleasure to introduce Tracy Flood. She is a member of the Council on Human Rights and has been for about four years. She is a lawyer. Um, her complete bio is, is in your program, um, but she's currently the president of the Bremerton NAW's NAACP uh, here in Bremerton. And um, she will be our moderator for this panel, and um, she's going to introduce our speakers. And I believe the um, the program has three of them uh, and our fourth one is Reverend Sylvester T. Turner uh, who is listed under about the presenters as well. So Tracy, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody doing out there? Everybody ready for the panel? We're going to give you a perspective um, similar to what you would see on a talk show. So we want to keep you guys blood flowing, get a little excitement, conversation, make sure you're um, just raring to go for the rest of the day and the wonderful workshops that will come this afternoon. So um, I will begin with, I am the president of the NAACP. It is for the entire county of Kitsap. We represent the peninsula. Um, 
NAACP Unit 1134. And as you know, the NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization around. And we are an organization that is not um, one that is limited to just African American people. We're an organization that fights for civil rights for all. So civil rights are human rights. And that is why I'm passionate about being on the Human Rights Council as well. Our panel speakers for this morning, I will start to my far right. Dr. Karen J. Bolton, she is the director for Guided Pathways at Olympic College. Um, she served in the United States Navy under USS Abraham Lincoln, and she is one who has done a lot of firsts. And those firsts are highlighted um, in the program in her 20 year career in the Navy. Um, she was the first female to be um, and to qualify as the flight deck supervisor. And she finished her doctorate degree, and we're very proud of her, um, and the first in her family to do that. But I think what we should highlight that um, should reign with so many as an example is she did this after doing her GED. And so many individuals get lost in the system and the whole concept of getting the GED and what path you can take after that. She's an example of how you can succeed. And so Karen Bolton, she'll give more of her background during the discussion. T.C. Curry. T.C. Curry is also a career in Navy. It's been in Kitsap County for a number of years, but served um, our community through um, what has now been 20 years um, during drug and alcohol as a probation officer with the county and um, 35 years of the program of Scared Straight. Um, he has traveled and worked Hawaii, Guam, San Francisco, so a very um, various perspectives that he will be able to lend to you. And our next panel member is Reverend Sylvester T. Turner, who is a part of the workshops this afternoon and graciously is joining us here on our panel this morning, born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. And um, he uh, recently joined the Hope of Cities as a community outreach director and serving as a director of development for the center in Richmond. Our next panel member is Aaron Leidick, and he has been a gem to me in the work that I've been doing throughout the NAACP as well as his work in Surge and other like-minded organizations with similar missions. His perspectives and skills um, work in our local community and local communities. Um, it's him wanting to lend his support and interdependence to increase liberation. Here in Kitsap County, he, again, he works with Surge, showing up for racial justice, civil survival, living arts, cultural heritage, and he's a member of the NAACP board, executive board as well. And he will tell you more about his background throughout the morning um, presentations. So the panel members were given some questions ahead of time. And some of those questions we'll address and we're welcoming questions from the audience. I believe there's a mic here. If you have a question um, after the conversation starts, feel free to make your way to the microphone and we will try to address it and if there's another microphone. There's a, a, a person that will walk around the room with the microphone as well from the board, so it's not there. That person, raise your hand, the mic will come to you. How about that? <laughs> so I wanna begin the conversation with a little history. 
We have personal perspectives and the path forward is the title of our panel. But in anything, there has to be some history. Where we came from, where we went, and where we're going. And the history here in the United States is one that presents many different perspectives. Having served in the United States Navy, I served because of my commitment to the country and needing finances to go to school. And the best way to do that was joining the Navy. But our history since before the Civil War, there has been devastation, fear, prejudice, intolerance, bias for people of color, for transgender people, those that are not what is considered the norm. And everybody's norm is different. But the American norm is the wife, the husband, two kids, the dog. But not the African American family, not the Native American family, not the Japanese family, not the Pacific Islanders family. And these are the challenges that we're faced with. So we're gonna look at the challenges on a national level and a statewide level. And then specifically, Kitsap County. So that's where we will begin. Each of the panel members can speak to what challenges they see from a historical sp perspective on a national level, a statewide level, and then specifically to Kitsap County. ever wants to begin. Can you hear me okay? Well, that'll work. Um, good morning. Uh, so I'm an educator. i try it one more time. Good morning. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Tracy, and thank you um, to Human Rights Council for inviting me um, to speak. Um, it's always um, an honor, and sometimes um, it's a little tough for me, uh, you know, because um, most, I tell people this, when I started out my educational career was um, dropping out of high school my senior year and proceed to lay on the couch and hang out, and then my mother got in me and said, y y you gotta, y what are you going to do? And so I went and got my GED and then, a month later, and then I went back and laid on the couch because I thought, you know, um, you know, I'm the youngest of seven children, so I thought, well, this is going to be cool. Mom and Dad and I can go on vacation together. You know, I can move to Florida with them, and, you know, I can help them out when they retire. And No, I had to get out. And it wasn't until I, I, I joined the Navy one day when my mom was on vacation in Florida, and my dad was working at GE, and um, it was Monday, and I'll never forget this. And then I, Dad came home, and I said, hey, Pop, I joined the Navy. And he said, oh. And I said, I'm leaving on Wednesday. He said, oh. I said, can you tell mom? He said, uh-uh. <laughs> and uh, and I, have, I, I don't have a lot of pictures of my parents together, but I do have one when the day I graduated boot camp. And my dad had these huge binoculars, which I know he got at the secondhand store because that's how my pop rolled. But they had the biggest smile on their face because it was like a successful launch. And it wasn't until years later that my brothers and I got together, uh, my, fa my father passed away, and we realized they had a plan that each one of us had to get out. And we, none of us ever came back. And we didn't realize. And one day, I remember my brother came home, and there was a package laying on the table and my, um, and with his name on it. And my mom said, well, what? My brother said, well, what is that? She's like, oh, I'm glad you asked. And she said, these are your dorm room keys. This is your class schedule. I filled out your FAFSA information. Your class is starting two weeks. And take care. We love you. Goodbye. And so each one of us, um, we're, we were encouraged to follow our own path.
but we weren't encouraged to stick around. And, you know, to know and understand, you know, it wasn't taught to my parents had passed away that in, I've been involved doing their history and uh, genealogy and realized that my dad was an only child. We don't really know his father or the name I carry, Bolton. And, and then I, I, I found some stories about my dad and, and how he was stolen a couple of times by white families and because he was mulatto and, and, and growing up in rural Mississippi and how he wasn't allowed to vote. Um, you know, and, and so when I really kind of think about the work that I'm doing now at Olympic College, I'm a faculty member, I teach organizational leadership, but right now I'm doing a temporary one-year job working for doc, with Dr. Mitchell um, to redesign our education system at Olympic College. It's a student initiative where basically we kind of clear the path for students to come in and get out. See, I got my mother in me. Because students who are first generation, students of color, students who are marginalized, they don't have the time, the money, or the resources to come here to explore and figure themselves out. So why don't we clear the path for them? So one of the biggest things in, in leading this discussion, and it's not easy having a discussion uh, with my colleagues. Yeah, I've, I feel, I can, this is a safe place, I can say this, right? Um, well, students need to come and find themselves. And I had to explain to them that that one student over there that you're talking about needs to find themselves is also working part time trying to put food on the table. That they're, you're, the way path forward for them right now is they're trying to figure out where they're going to go, what degree, what certificate, what four year program I'm going to go to. We, we don't have time for that. And so in the biggest number, and I always throw this at them because it's all about the data, 50% of our students from across the street graduate and go nowhere. And I'm not talking graduate and go to the shipyard, they go nowhere. And 30% don't consider themselves college students. The college isn't for them, they just, you know, I'm not smart enough. I've been down that road before. And you know, when you have a GED and you drop out of high school and you're trying to, to navigate your way through an education system that's not designed for you. And I'll, and I'll share this one last story with you as I was working on my doctorate, I had a, a faculty member told me my writing wasn't scholarly. And I remember the effect that it had on me in a doctoral program and the stigma that I put on myself. And I had to, I had to break it down and say, look, man, I, I was in the Navy, okay? So while all you, everyone here was going to college and hanging out, you know, I was on the flight deck in the middle of the Persian Gulf at 130 degrees watch a plane's coming at me 160 knots, and they're trying to drag people into safety when, when things would happen, when things would go down. Oh, I said, so I have a different way of expressing myself. I have a different way of writing. Uh, and, and luckily, I, I had to curtail my language a lot, too. So, you know, one of my perspectives and how I look at things is I always look at things from a student perspective. I'm here for my students. I'm here for Kitsap County, so that's me. Good morning. I, I want to say, first of all, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak at this panel. Um, my name is T.C. Curry. Um, I'm currently a probation officer at Juvenile Department. I've been a probation officer for about 20 years. Uh, I'm also uh, a previous member of the uh, U.S. Navy. I'm a retired Navy as well. Um, if you look at my bio, um, I was a school teacher at one time. And I, and I taught school at the uh, skill centers for, for two years. It, 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 it was fun, it, but it was challenging. And what I want uh, you to know today that um, I, I work consistently with students um, in, in, in a school district every day. And I, I, I'm a statistic as well. Uh, I dropped out of college. Uh, I wanted to be uh, a proud member of my family. I, I wanted to be the first uh, to graduate from college. Uh, I was doing very well. At one time, um, I made it to my junior year, and then, you know, I got in a little trouble, and um, I had to leave school, uh, but I, I turned to the Navy. I, I joined the military. I, I learned a lot in the Navy. I, I went back to school. Uh, I got my college degree. Um, uh, again, uh, I emphasize how important uh, education is today, and I, when I, when I mentor students um, from time to time, I, I keep telling them 
how important uh, school is to them. And, and this is what my students tell me. They said, well, TC, I understand college is, is good and, and you know, you can make a lot of money, but um, I, I don't need to go to college. I, I can make money on the streets. I, I can make m just as much money as you can. Um, when I hear this, this tells me one of two things. Uh, they might be doing something maybe possibly illegal uh, doing this. They, they may not. My point is um, it's, it's hard to keep any student tasks and focus on education uh, because there's so many obstacles. There's so many things in the way that deter a student uh, from achieving the education and it's peer pressure, drugs, alcohol, and, and many other things that, that causes issues in a family. Uh, what I would try to do on a consistent basis, like I normally do, is uh, I will continue to work with any student uh, to see that they achieve their goal. But goals and expectations is very hard to a student uh, because they, they, they run into many, many problems uh, trying to stay focused. And, and I'm just going to go right to families. There's a lot of family dynamics that's going on um, in, in a household where it, it may be a single family, it may be two family, uh, a mother and a father, and, and, and they're working two jobs. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to do whatever they need to do to make this household um, uh, go ahead and, and, and be achievable. But there are so many things that's in the way that's keeping a student focused on education and doing the, the right thing. People like me, people like you, I just encourage you, if you had the opportunity, be a mentor. You'd be surprised how helpful you can be to any student at any given time because you can relate to the individual. They may not be able to relate to me, but they may be able to relate to you. Long story short is I will continue to work uh, in the community tirelessly uh, as I have been in, in, in the past. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to leave it on this note. Um, there's a young lady back there named Karen Vargas. She didn't know I was going to talk about her. Uh, when, when, I, when I arrived here in uh, 1992, um, I was a Navy recruiter, and I wanted to do something to um, possibly uh, interest these individuals to maybe uh, consider uh, maybe joining the Navy and, and doing something constructive uh, in their life. Um, I uh, implemented a class at Bremerton High. It was called Cultural Awareness. I had 35 students uh, that met me on a weekly basis, and, and, and I'm going to tell you what we talked about. We talked about drugs, alcohol. Uh, we talked about prostitution. We talked about education. We talked about any and everything that made these kids think about what they wanted to do with their life. It was very inspirational. I thank you, Karen, for helping me do that. Um, I took these kids uh, to Monroe Prison. I took uh, the guys to Monroe Prison. I took the girls to uh, Purdy uh, to give them a sobering look uh, at life behind bars. Um, it, of course, it inspired some, and some it did not. I can't help everyone, and neither can anyone in this room help everyone. But I'm going to tell you, help goes a long way and I just encourage anyone to do whatever they can to give back to the community. And um, I just encourage you to, to stay focused and help a student in, in, in a time of need. Thank you very much. My name is, is T. Turner. I am from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, Richmond was and some people can still consider it to be the um, capital of the Confederacy. Uh, it's interesting as I hear the other stories of how um, much we had in common. Uh, first thing I would like to say though is I, I believe I'm the only one in here that um, was in the Air Force. Everybody else was in the Navy. <laughs> Your brother was pretty smart. <laughs> However, my best friend was in the Navy. Um, but growing up in, in Richmond, I was actually the 14th of 15 children. And I was the first one in my family to graduate high school. Uh, what is interesting is uh, my senior year, I had three classes, and at Christmas break, I 
had a point zero 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 average. I had three F's in three classes, and I will never forget that January day, my last year, I ended up living with my sister. My mother moved to Philadelphia, and uh, the pool hall was my first life. And I had come home after spending all day in the pool hall, and I went in the bathroom to wash my hands, and when I came back, because my sister would always leave her plate, uh, or my plate, on the stove for me. And she was sitting at the table. And I remember her saying, I went to the school today. And I lost all of my appetite. But if you know my sister, I called her the general from the south. I have one sister I call the general from the north who lives in Philly. And then there's the general from the south, whatever they say goes. Um, and I used to her being fussy, but I'd never used to her being hurt. And when she said that, I could see that I was hurting her. And I said, well, I've got to do something. I never knew how important it was to my family for me to graduate high school. And I straightened up and I graduated with all D's. <laughs> but I graduated. <laughs> And then I, I just knew there was something that I had to, that there, there was something in me um, that I, I was good at whatever I put my mind to. I was good at sports. Blew that because I didn't go to school. I was a very good baseball player. I was good at pool. Anything that I put my time in, I was good. Um, and I remember having a conversation with myself one day. And I said, you know, if you put your time in anything, if you invest that much time in anything, you'll be good at it. So it gave me a spark. Um, I joined the Air Force. After the Air Force, I was able to go to college because my grades wouldn't have allowed me to get into anybody's college. I went to college in uh, California at Cal State Fullerton. Um, and thought I had escaped Richmond. After 18 years, I was sort of drawn back. And once returning uh, to Richmond, I could see the city that I love from a, a perspective that I couldn't see it when I lived there. And I could see the racial divide and I could see the impact that race had played in, in shaping me uh, and shaping the city that I love. And at, from that point, I engaged myself with an organization that I still work with. Uh, and over the last close to 30 years, uh, I have been working uh, along the lines to build, um, uh, to create healing across racial lines through the work that we do at the organization that I'm a part of called Initiatives of Change. So uh, in a nutshell, I had to go around Robin Hood's bond um, to find that where I was called to be is where I was born. And my work over those years have been um, driven by the need to bring us closer together. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name's Aaron, and uh, like other folks up here have said, um, I want to thank Tracy and the council, um, OC, everybody who's here, and 
uh, Bremerton community, Kitsap County community as well for making this kind of a space possible. Um, Squamish people, of course, whose land we're on, but I think every f everyone who's invested in this work of human rights and takes the time to come together and really focus on it. So um, I'm going to get off the stage now because I don't have a military background. <laughs> I, I'm up here, I'm like, I was a drum major. <laughs> That's the closest I've got. I was the drum major. So, you know, okay, so I can walk behind at least. Um, so I, I am not originally from Kitsap County. Uh, I'm from a, a very rural area of a very rural state. Uh, the, the state that I grew up in, Nebraska, um, my family, uh, most of my family it has been small family farmers there for multiple generations with the exception of my maternal grandmother who's from North Carolina. And um, I mention that because when I think about doing the work of justice and human rights work, I think um, our people who, who bring us up and where they come from and their context really, it, for me anyway, it informs the way that I enter that work. So um, where I grew up, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I just turned 43 a few days ago. So um, I was born in 1974 and I came up in what is known where I'm from as the small uh, family farm crisis. So in the late 70s and early 80s, um, a time when a lot of large corporate businesses, uh, business farms were displacing uh, small family farms in sort of the northern Great Plains especially. And so that was my first exposure to organizing and activism for community. And what I remember from that time, I grew up in a, in a very rural area as I said, like to me Bremerton is a city and when people call it a town I think that's funny, right? To me a town is a place where um, there are no chain restaurants, there are no billboards, there are, you know, all these things that are um, part of the city space to me. So um, my area, and I mention that because in that sort of a context uh, where I'm from, it's uh, more, it's mostly a poor and working class white community and the idea of individual stories is the norm of the day. So systemic or institutional or any kind of that framing didn't really happen when I was growing up. That was present in our lives. That's part of the world as it is for all of us. That's not how folks talked about it. But in, so things like, um, I remember uh, like I, what we learned growing up and talking about who you were, who your people were, your family was, we would use this phrase. Um, like I would say, talking about Tracy and Tracy's kid. Oh, this is Tracy's child, you know, belongs to Tracy. That's how we would talk. My grandma would say when I'd say, here's these people who are my new friends from this town over, she'd say, well, who do they belong to, right? That was the way that people mapped it out. Yeah, <laughs> and so, um, so that's a very individual way, but also an interdependent community way. But what it misses is the institutional and the systemic. So in, in this time in the 80s when I was coming up and I was, a, I was a child, but my parents were sort of on the front lines of that community organizing, I remember thinking, um, what is, there's something bigger. There's, the, the bigger problem can't be coming from one mean person, you know, who's making all of these adults around me cry all the time about <laughs> all these things that are going um, wrong. And I think I didn't have the words for that at that point. But that, for me, was the beginning of thinking we need more than just telling our individual stories to, to take care of each other and to have each other's backs. Um, so that is the way that I come into this work, is to um, be asking myself, what are the pieces that I am not seeing from my position? And what's on the other side of these injustices when I am working on them from my side? Um, and in that example, which I'm happy to talk with anyone about, um, what was happening on the other side was the U.S. government um, setting up oligarchies in Central America and displacing small farmers there as well, right? Was that part of our conversation where I was living? Absolutely not, right? So that interdependence is present, but it's happening. We need to come to it on that um, big systemic scale as well. So, um, and, you know, and I was a drum major. So that's my last thing I'm going to say. I'm going to hand it back to Tracy, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled to be up here with everybody.
So we've gotten a nice historical background and perspective from all of our panel members. And I want to pose a question. They have kind of intertwined some of their comments along with um, questions, again, that were presented to them, as well as the introduction that I gave. Um, and then we'll turn to um, the moving forward piece and um, basically what I would consider answering the challenges. We talked about challenges. And then, of course, we want to make sure we wrap it up with answering the challenges. TC Curry talked a little bit about mentoring. And then the conversation, you saw a little bit of those things that help as far as what's next and what um, you can do to answer the call. But also, language. So I'm going to pick up with where Aaron just kind of left out is the language. The language, the cultural language that we speak as individuals. It's very different. If you're from a certain area, certain things may mean one thing to one family member or one group of people that it doesn't mean to a bigger group of people. And one of the things that stands out in my mind is when you're thinking and you're trying to make your way through corporate America, that at, on an African American perspective, you have to be twice as good in the language of who do you represent? So with that, being culturally aware, and even on the sense of today's terminology, when you talk about equity and inclusion, how many people, when they hear the word equity, and you're in a conversation, think, oh, things are equal. We're in a better position. But it's not equal. It's what is equity. So if the panel can, and if you don't, you don't have to speak to the issue if it's not something you want to add to, but the question is how history affects our current behaviors? How does history affect our current behaviors? And um, intertwining any tensions between our history and today? I will try to tackle that briefly. Um, our history really does speak to our present. Um, in that, when when I do um, I, I do uh, uh, slave trail walks in in Richmond that um, take us through that history and the impact of that history. Um, and one of the things that I talk about um, is what are the tentacles from that institution. When you don't understand the history, you don't always understand the tentacles or the byproducts of that history. Uh, one story that I share with individuals when I do the walk um, is about um, the first African-American governor in the U.S. Well, Doug Wilder is from Richmond, so everybody in Richmond hear them say, well, Doug is the first elected African-American governor. Um, but I said, well, who's the first governor? And I've had over 20 years, maybe, maybe 10 people to come up with the answer, the correct answer. But it was an individual by the name of Pickney Pinchback. Pickney Pinchback was the governor of Louisiana in 1872. And I tell the story of, of how he became. He was voted senator. The lieutenant governor died, and he was appointed, and the governor was impeached. So he became governor. And, and then when they recognized it was 1872, six, seven years after the institution of slavery was over, then I asked him, well, what happened? 
there were more African American political leaders in the South 15 years after the institution of slavery uh, than there were up until 20 plus years ago. So you ask what happened? Um, and you know, they would, some people would say, well, reconstruction. And that's true. However, when they peel back the layers of what Reconstruction meant, um, 1901 Alabama Constitution was the third, no, was, a, was three, three and a half times larger than any constitution in the world. It was filled with black codes. It framed the constitutions for Virginia and other states in the South. The 1902 Constitution in Virginia, uh, prior to the passing of that Constitution, there were 217,000 registered African American voters. Overnight, that number was reduced to 21,000. From 217,000 to 21,000 overnight. So the institution of slavery uh, transferred from an institutionalization to constitutionalization. So within that constitution um, were all of these codes that created division between people. If you don't understand that history, then you don't understand why we deal with affirmative action. If you don't deal with that history, you don't understand why it's important that we fight for the right to vote. When you don't understand that history, then we are all duped by that history. So, so many of the things that we're dealing with today is driven by that constitutionalization from the Civil War and from that period because that period wasn't just about acts. It was also about a mentality and a spirit that continued to operate in how we function today. So history has always been critical in trying to create healing uh, in any community that you're working in. You know, when I, I think about history and our current situation, um, I'm always, <laughs> I remember the election, as we all do, I'm still in mourning, but um, I had some of my friends, uh, white friends, crying. And just, I don't know, what are we going to do? I'm like, pull yourself together. I mean, you know, and, and I had to talk about, um, you know, and, and still to say, I feel like I'm, I'm doing a lot of counseling with people with over the election and, and, and Trump. I'm like... You know, why we took our eye off the ball, and I'll just go down the road real quick, is that meanwhile, when Obama, we had a great eight years, you know, they're taking over school boards, city council, state, you know. So, it's a, I'll go back a little bit, and, and I tell people about the history about a revolution and when people rise up. Um, and folks are jammed up. Only Trump could turn Alabama blue, right? And the reason why Alabama turned blue is why? Does, do most of you guys know? The black women went out and vote, right? Because we understand, we know. And so when you look at the history, don't, don't clap, vote. Um, <laughs> so when we look at the history as affect our current behavior, the issue that we're running up against is that people don't remember the history. And we don't, we don't realize, we don't remember that there was a revolution. Um, you know, the boycotting and things like that, the bus boycott, and, 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 and I, I tell people, I want you to do a little history. How did Martin Luther King get all those people to march, right, in D.C.? Wasn't, wasn't putting it up on Facebook, right? You didn't get a Twitter. How'd that happen? Through churches, through people talking and getting people out there. So in, as we go through and we're getting so further away from the, the um, things that happened from people protesting from the Vietnam War, 
um, from think protesting from all the way, and and even going back to the Civil War, I I, I came back from a trip from D.C. and my brother, you know, every time we go to D.C., I said I want to do one thing historical. So we went to Mount Vernon to see um, Washington, you know, his his land. So I went and I was like, oh, slave quarters. Okay, I'm going there. So as I'm looking, it's on the map, right? But when you look at the signs, there's no signs that go, this is where the slave quarters are. And then I started hearing this indentured servant. I was like, what did they say? It was, what, I'm sorry, what did you say? And so I, I was like, oh my gosh. So it took me, it took us, what, 30 minutes to find the slave quarter. And it was a huge area. And then there was a white woman sitting there in the, the little shack. Nice shack, by the way. And she was dressed up in period thing and talking about how, you know, this is how the slave, the indentured servants and how they were indentured and they worked the land and this is where the families were. And I noticed the little white kids running around and go, oh, that's so nice. And, and then they'd hop and skip out. And then I'm sitting there getting jammed up. And then, right, right. And, 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 uh, and my brother's like, please don't say nothing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to say something. So I asked the woman, I said, why didn't you say slave? Well, I did. No, you didn't. Well, yes, I didn't. No, you did not say slave. You said indentured. And so I noticed throughout the whole grounds, they don't call them slaves. They don't talk about how families were ripped apart. They don't talk about how, they, it, you didn't see any of that. And so I'm looking at that four-year-old kid running around not hearing that, that these are slave quarters. They didn't hear that. They just hear, oh, they were indentured. So now, you know, we're whitewashing our history. So that, that's where I'm at today. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go down a road, right? But, but that's really what's affecting it to, uh, uh, us today. And we, we got away from understanding the struggles that in the human rights violations that they got us to where people will understand that, you know, my father couldn't vote. I told my class that, well, what do you mean he couldn't vote? Like, he could not vote. He had to take a test. And then when he go to take the test, he'd get the money to pay to take the test, they go, well, to that test of the day, you got to come back tomorrow. Then you have to walk four or five miles back and come back tomorrow, right? Well, the lady's not here. And then you have to go back and forth. And then the test, then you have to wait for a test just to vote. So they, they were like, that really happened? Yes, it happened. So we, there's a part of history that's, that's just being left out. We're not even talking about. So when, when people under ask me why aren't I so upset about oh I'm upset about the election but you know we shall overcome and we will be united right but we have to know and understand the history you can't forget the history I just want to say um, briefly that one thing that kind of jumps out and reminds me about uh, history in general when I, when I look back and, and I was um, I was listening uh, to Mr. Uh, Moriaki, uh, very very inspirational uh, speech earlier. I, I want to commend you on that. And I was taking some notes, and, and one of the things that um, that stuck out, some things you said about the um, the human rights uh, violations that um, some of your uh, <coughs> ancestors had to go through. And when I look back on history, um, there there's going to be adversity uh, every single day from this from this day forward. Um, is there discrimination? Is, is there racism today? I, I want you to be the judge of that. Um, I have my own opinion, I, and I'm quite sure you have yours. But what sticks out to me is, is, is the one thing that I stress when I talk to students every single day, and that's education. And then it also, when I go back, I look at something that happened many, many years ago. Um, Thurgood Marshall uh, brought something to uh, Supreme Court Justice and it was something called uh, Brown against Brown. Um, it, was, it was something um, that was very inspirational that, that, that turned history upside down. Um, it came to the fact that um, where every individual was awarded an education without discrimination. And, and there was a time where uh, myself, being raised in Cleveland, Ohio, I attended um, elementary, junior high, high school, all African American. Um, there, there was no whites uh, in my school. But when I look back in history, there was a time 
where uh, <laughs> let, let, I just want to keep it real. Um, there was discrimination. They didn't want blacks and whites and other people to be in the same school. We have come a long, long way. Uh, we have a long way to go. The only thing that I want to uh, stress today on, on, on where we need to go is, is to stay focused, do what you can to, uh, to make sure the society moves forward. Um, racism, discrimination, it's always going to be in existence. It's what you do to put your foot forward to do something about it, vice talking about it. That's what I have to say. Uh, when I think about history affecting us now, I think, um, you know, what white supremacy norms are the best at is replicating themselves over and over and hiding their tracks as they do it. So um, I'm glad, Karen, you mentioned black women getting out the vote in Alabama. And, you know, we, of course we all clap because, right? Like, <laughs> of course we're excited that that happened. And um, I just want to encourage those of us who are not black women to sit with that for a moment and think about all the things that work against that. So like, what are we doing in addition to clapping, right? Um, how are we getting money, power, access, influence, uh, relationship support, everything um, into the wheelhouse of black women who obviously are leading that work. So the thing I want to mention about the history reaffecting too is I think when I say white supremacy norms, I just want to underline I, the probably most folks in this room, this is language you're used to anyway, but I'm not speaking about people in uniforms with swastikas marching, I'm speaking about things like perfectionism over contribution, indi individual over interdependence, um, achievement and accumulation over equity and sharing of resources. That's the level that I see repeating itself over and over. Um, it takes place in our, in our organizing around right, rights works, when, rights work when, um, we're in a meeting and we feel a panic if it feels out of control instead of an energy that people are engaged but not on our timeline, right? Uh, those are the ways that I see it coming up over and over. And like has been mentioned many times, um, the, the whitewashing of the history and how um, that's part of the, our indoctrination, I think, in, into whiteness in US culture and I'm always trying to be aware of this is I see the moments where I see that that's happened because it's a history that I know and where are the moments where I'm not noticing it. So the Stonewall movie that came out a while back, I don't know if anybody saw it, I didn't go see it because I was mad, I almost used a naughty word, I was mad about it. It shows a young uh, white cisgender, just came out gay man sort of leading that moment. It's, it's not true, it's a lie, like that <laughs> moment in history you can look up um, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and read about them and learn about them. There's a really good movie um, about Marsha P. Johnson that recently came out. Um, both black women, trans women, queer women. Um, that is one story that I knew, right? So when the inaccurate information and the whitewashing of history came up before me, I knew that and I knew to resist that narrative and counter that and center the leadership that was actually there in that moment. And I also know there's many times that's happening every day in my daily life that I don't know. So to bring that critical lens and be asking is important, but I can't do it alone. And the relationship pieces are what help us all do that work together, right? So if I'm in relationship and community, organizing around rights and justice, um, someone will call me in and say, hey, I see you're really excited about this book, but did you know, right? And like what you just explained to me about the governor of Louisiana, of Louisiana, I didn't know, right? So now I do, that's exciting. Now I'm gonna go and learn more. So that's why it's so good to come to these conferences. <laughs> so I, as a member of the Human Rights Council, um, we tend to have um, presentations and workshops um, where different speakers give their own different perspectives. And I think it's important for me to just highlight right now that we 
are not a political organization, but what we try to do is, and you see our mission on the back of the pamphlet, is educate. And in order to do that, you have to give different perspectives. So I want to make sure that no one here walks away with a feeling of that we're promoting one party over another party, but that we're all like-minded. We're here to learn and to get different perspectives at different times. So with that, I want to pick up on 2015 marked the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But those who follow the Supreme Court knows that this, the Voting Rights Act was gutted. And there are many challenges, court challenges that continue around the Voting Rights Act. But that historical perspective goes back to um, when John Lewis led the marches across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, which is very significant to what just happened. And I thought that it was very important to highlight that. But as you heard, there's the historical perspective of understanding voting, the poll tax, the literary test, um, the grandfather's clause, that there's a lot of history that's there that is built in the civil rights movement that affects what are conditions and what happens today. Without that history, the progress that has been made wouldn't be possible. And one year prior to the Voting Rights Act was the Civil Rights Act, as I said, of 1964. So when you see those things, you go from the devastation and fear that I mentioned earlier to yes, there has been progress. But as TC said, there's a long way to go. There's been significant progress in the private sector and um, people that have arisen to corporate America. But with that brings us to our moving forward closing question. And if there's any audience question, I think we'll have time for one or two. Moving forward, what do you feel from your own personal perspectives are, are actions we can take to help heal the divide of where we are now? And we talked a little bit about mentoring young people. We talked a little bit about cultural awareness. But specifically bring that around to, there's been a lot of things that have happened in our history. There's a lot that's happening now. How do we bring that healing? So I'm a firm believer into getting messy, right? You got to get in there. You got to do the work. And, you know, in full disclosure, um, I didn't want to do the work. I'm, I remember when I was in the Navy, I had, um, it was my last year, and they said, oh, you got to go to diversity training. And I used to laugh and go, yeah, I'm good to go. I, you know, I don't need to go. I've been there, done there. I got the t-shirt. They're no, no. And then they came out and they said, yeah, we need, um, you have to go. And I said, okay. Then I found out later it was we need two people from each, you know, group. And then we weren't all, we were all in civilian clothes. And it went downhill from there. And we ended up, this one white woman looked at me and started crying and apologizing for slavery. And I was like, what? I'm like, I gotta go. So, so I've been, I've been avoiding it because I don't want to, I don't want to have the conversation. It's not easy for me to have that conversation. I don't want to have to explain things. And let, and let me, let me tell you why. Um, because it's tough for me because I have to live in this every day, right? I wake up and I know that people look at me and half the time people go, oh, you work here? Oh, you teach? You're, yeah, yes, I teach. No, I'm, actually, now I'm a director here. So yes, yes. Oh, you have your doctorate? Yes. So I have to. I still have to go through this every day. So one of the things I had to do is I had to take a step back and do the work. I went and got a mentor. Not one. But I have three. Then I set, then I went to the Social Justice Leadership Institute, which is a cross-institutional program 
um, that 20 people from across the 34 community technical colleges, and we go to the Leadership uh, Institute over in uh, Whidbey Island, have you guys been there? You get 20 people of color out in the woods, and you start talking about be careful coyotes, folks start freaking out. I was laughing because I like to camp, but so, but we, we got in there and we start, we got into the messiness and start doing some healing, right? And then from there, I, I did the faculty mentoring where I get, you know, I'm a mentor to other faculty of color in the CTC, Community Technical College System. So I had to go do the work and I had to do the healing so that I could sit here and have conversations with you about diversity and inclusion. I think a way forward for us and for our country to heal is to do, is do the work. You know, does education level the playing field? It might, it might, right? But why not open the doors and allow people to come in? You know, I don't care if you're not a United States citizen. You wanna to go to college? Good, I need more students in my class, right? So when, when we think about this, you know, I, I go back to, you know, to understand though, it's all about being in the messiness and doing the work. Y'all are here, y'all are showing up, y'all are doing the work, right? But, but it doesn't stop there, you know, we, you know, you have to go out and you have to talk people, right? You have to get, you have to, get to know people, you have to go to conferences uh, and just open yourself up to, to, you know, another world and be able to, to talk to folks. So, you know, yeah, that's about it. I have this to say, uh, I see a young lady right there in the blue. I know you had a question, I saw your hand up. We're gonna get to you in a minute. Uh, I just have this to say um, regarding, I, I've been to a lot of uh, community meetings uh, in the past since I've been living here. And when I go to a meeting, uh, there's a lot of great ideas. Uh, people come up with um, uh, ideas that's, that, that will probably work, and I, and, and I hear it. Uh, but then after the meeting, um, this is what I see. I see all these particular uh, inputs at this meeting, they kind of be stalemated. What, I, what I'm trying to say is this, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a stickler regarding focusing, getting these kids educated. Have you ever saw some homework that these kids bring home and they ask you for help? If they ask me, they are asking the wrong person because I don't understand the math, I don't understand the equations. I don't understand because there's a new curriculum about education. So this is the point I'm making. The point I'm making is this. When a student is asking their parents for help and the parents is giving the feedback to the student and says, you know, I, 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 I wanna help, but I can't. So that's where tutors come into place. And I know for a fact in this particular room, there's some expertise that you may be helpful to a student in a school or any kind of educational environment. You have no idea what you can provide to the community if you put your foot forward. And I know you may say, I don't have time or, or I'm too busy. And I totally understand that, I respect that. So again, I'm just gonna put it back on the people in the community. If you got five, 10 minutes, You'd be surprised, that'll go a long way to help a student. Because I'm gonna tell you, the teachers at the school are overwhelmed. But there are people in the community that can assist the teachers to help these students stay on task regarding math, English, and any other course. So please do your best to give back, to help these students mentor and tutor, very vital. That's my input, that's my, that's my feedback to you. Um, my 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 thought around this is, is very similar to Karen's, um, maybe a little different. And and anyway, it's about being intentional. This elephant have to be eaten one bite at a time, and we try to swallow it. Um, and being intentional uh, is very important. It's important because we arrived at this place from intentionality. Now, I didn't have a whole lot of time to really deal with the tentacles, but the tentacles created um, white privilege. 
the tentacles play a major role in implicit bias. All of these things that we are currently dealing with as sciences are now, um, but they were the byproducts of some intentional laws, some intentional actions. We have to be intentional. Uh, this evening uh, in the workshop, I will talk a little bit about the difference between uh, being responsive and being reactive. Um, and when you are intentional, you can be, you can respond to things instead of being um, reactional. Because in Charlottesville, um, we made national news. But within 24 hours, we had assembled 300 people that in Richmond that, had, that included the mayor, the governor, three state senators, four or five uh, four or five city council people and about 275 individuals from all different uh, walks of life. We were able to do that because over the years we have been intentional about bringing individuals to the table. So when crises happen, it's not just reacting it's responding. When I, I'm glad about the end results from the Alabama election, but we forget almost 49% of the people voted for a known pedophile. And in the name of five or six different things or reasons. We weren't voting for the person. We were voting for the position so that we could do this, that, and the other. If we're not intentional about dealing with those individuals, then what we do will be limited as relate to the possibility of what we do can be when we, are when we are intentional about making sure that we are engaging individuals from different sectors. I just want to follow up to that real quick because I think it's very important to point out, you know, I saw some of those interviews, I'm like, you know, well, what are we going to do? We can't vote for a Democrat. And one of the things that, to have a little empathy for them, I know it's tough, but their world is changing. They had a black president. That freaked them out, right? And their whole, well, I don't understand that, and how could we let this happen? And then, but if you look at the demographics and you look at the census, what's going to happen in 25 years? So, um, so I, I have a little empathy for them because they're scared, and I understand that. And I always, when I, when I approach these people and, and have these conversations, which I always like to do, is I always approach it, and I'm a little empathetic, and I go, I, I understand, it's tough for you, isn't it? It's tough. Oh, I, you know, Obama did, I understand. You know, your whole world is changing. Life is crumbling. And so I get it. So. Uh, I want to take a question. Oh, I'm just going to say, yeah, what they said, like, whiteness is kind of scared now. And I'm talking about individual white people, but, like, the concept of it is freaking out because, it, because of that construction, that thing that we've created in our society, like, we took that, we took the power and traded away community, cultural history, you know, shared experiences, traditions for power. And so it's a long game, like, the intentionality, I think. It's a long game, and I think um, to think about how do we want the means by which we do it to be in alignment with the end, not justifying it. That makes sense. So I would like to take the one question. I saw there was a hand that's been up. 
Hi, my name is Gina Voladora, and I've actually worked with young people for my entire career, which is maybe longer than you would guess. Um, but um, a little backstory: I grew up uh, in a very rural, well, I grew up in a very poor uh, school where I graduated from. Um, and I always felt kind of dejected and like, oh, why don't I have these other great things? Why don't I have these, a pool like this school over here? Why don't I have all of this? As I've gotten older, um, I've been working a lot in the education system lately. I've had the opportunity to be in a lot of local schools and to see a lot of what uh, they are identifying as issues they want to address. And it always seems like they want to address the issue of this gap in performance or going to AP classes or attending college in the, what they'll call marginalized groups. Okay, Usually that means people of color. Sometimes it means um, people with gender, uh, non-binary gender, things like that. And I sit in there and they've spent all of this money on these tests and uh, specialists and, and surveys and I look around at 75 almost exclusively white people and I say you had to spend money on this <laughs> while my school was very very poor we had a great representation of minority teachers or I should say people of color because as we pointed out in my region we weren't the minority so while we may not have had the best books, or books at all sometimes, we had some phenomenal role models that are not, not to say that we don't have some great teachers up here, we have some fabulous teachers. But when I look around, I'm not seeing these kids that they're trying to desperately seek out, how do we help these kids? To me, the, the very earliest and longest lasting mentors for young people are their teachers. Why aren't they being represented in the schools? And I've talked to some people and I know that Bremerton years ago, or I was told that Bremerton years ago engaged in a practice called corrective hiring, corrective employment, where they did try to bring in more people. I don't know really what came of that. <laughs> My question is, and then it's a cycle, because when people, when kids don't see themselves represented, then they don't want to become a teacher. And I've talked to people in some of the schools and they've said, well, we would love to hire, you know, people of color, minorities, but they just don't apply. My question is to you guys, what do you see as a solution for that? So glad you brought that up. Um, there's been some um, work being done um, in the um, uh, CTC system uh, to address those issues. And one of the things is that well, when you are a faculty member of color, um, you are marginalized. It is, it is not easy. Um, you know, and so one of the things, that, because we have the mentoring program, so I have a mentee that's in another college um, in Wenatchee. Uh, and so one of the other things to address is, um, because I had this discussion at the state board last week, about student success initiatives and you know like you know closing the achievement gap and addressing um, inequities uh, when it comes to our students and I said but it all comes down to who are you hiring and how are you hiring them so a lot of the colleges now are addressing the um, the application so the couple things I know President Obama was trying to get rid of the check the box and you know that initiative where the people don't have to check that box that they have a criminal background. But the other thing is the qualifications. So I purposely asked my president, Dr. Mitchell, how are we gonna attract that call, recent college graduate from Spelman College who wants to teach at a community, English at a community college? When, the, when the, the qualification says, you need to have four to five years teaching experience. So if you look now, a lot of the colleges in the CTC system are removing a lot of the biases in the application, in the qualifications box. Um, because we can't work on these diversity and inequity issues unless it's, it, whenever I walk into a room, I'm the only person of color, that's an issue. But then I'm not supported. So a lot of things are happening. It's slow, it's very slow. And if you look at all of our community colleges and our presidents, there's not many 
presidents of color, but they, but they do get it. So, but every college campus will have a diversity and equity and inclusion person, whether it's a VP or director or whatnot at each campus. So things are happening. Um, is it slow? Of course it's slow. It's a community college system. So, you know, it's like dog ears sometimes in working on initiatives. Um, but it, I do believe we are making inroads. We are out of time. But what I do want to highlight, I would have loved to have more questions. Um, but what I do want to highlight is our panel members um, will be available during lunch, after, after lunch, there's workshops, there's um, the reconciliation um, approach where um, Dr. Bolton and um, Mr. Turner will be, as well as Aaron has his um, workshop where he'll be. So there's uh, uh, opportunities for more time to be able to address the panel members um, throughout today's conference. I live here and I do the workshop I'm doing at this conference often and I'll come wherever you are and I'll do it. Go to this workshop, <laughs> not to mine, <laughs> if you're choosing. I'm, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what the rules are about how many people fit in rooms, but I'm just saying don't come to mine if you can come to mine another time. <laughs> well, that's a humbling. That's, that's very humbling. So, um, but again, there's the opportunity to come. So we're going to go on... Um, and for the time in our program now so that you guys aren't rushing through your food. But we have um, an awards presentation. Every year we do the Linda Gra Gabriel Awards, so I'm gonna bring our MC back up so that she can do the presentation of those awards. And please thank my panel members again. Thank you, Tracy, and our panelists. Thank you again. Just give them a hand. It's wonderful. There's, there's never enough time, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> but we will keep working and working together. I hope during um, lunch that you are able to meet with each other. Um, and I want um, just briefly to mention that in your packet is an evaluation form. So be sure and fill those, uh, fill it out, fill it out for the whole day. And um, after the, the second breakout session, we'll meet back in here just briefly. Um, be sure you have your evaluations filled out and bring them, turn them in to us. So we look at each one of them and try to improve from year to year. Um, I want to acknowledge um, very briefly, we have some members of our Council for Human Rights that will be leaving um, at the end of this year. Um, Rob Purser it just has become overwhelmed with other, other duties and he is leaving the council. Uh, Diana Foster has had some medical issues and is leaving. and. Um, Andrea, if you'd come up here real quickly. Um, Andrea Hendricks has just uh, been an invaluable member and nursing school unfortunately is, social and social work are taking her away from us. But we know that she's gonna continue the work. Um, her wife, Erica, has been invaluable in doing our programs over the years and, and doing our flyers. And so I just have a little token for the two of you. Our awards that we give um, used to be the Wall of Fame and um, a few years ago, that was changed to the Linda Gabriel Awards. Linda Gabriel was a very active member of all kinds of organizations in our county and devoted much of her life to, to social justice work. And um, so 
when she passed, we uh, renamed it from the Wall of Fame to, to Linda Gabriel Awards. And this year we have three that we are presenting. The first one is to the Kitsap Regional Library System. And um, Jeannie and Lisa, if you want to come up. Before I give them their points, I um, just wanted to say that we want to recognize the regional library. You, you are so incredible. And what we found is that when a need arises in this county, you seem to be right there. Um, from, from closing the gap between communities at risk and affluent communities, they're, they're bridging that gap. Um, they have so many free services. Uh, they have technical assistance, so IT assistance, and um, the availability of computers in every library so that people who cannot afford their own have access to, to information and to the web. They start with very young children having programs for mothers and children and story times and um, they have a wonderful program for third graders who get to go to their regional library branch and get their own library card and I know uh, when I was a teacher that was just a highlight of the year for third graders to get their own card um, they have a meal distribution center they help with elementary uh, lunches during the summertime. They feed teenagers. Um, they have a teenage program to get kids in, involved in the community and work on some STEM programs. There's a STEM summer camp. Um, they, in line with our theme this year of historical perspectives, they have an extensive genealogy program. So they, they are serving from the very youngest in our, our community to the very oldest in our community. And we just want to acknowledge you for that. And it, you are serving the human rights of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next recipient is Michael Goodnow. If you would come up. <laughs> and I'm checking my notes because I just don't want to leave anything out. This information isn't in your program. So. Michael is currently the board president of Kitsap Pride Network and has made it his purpose and passion to unite, celebrate, and support the LGBTQ community in Kitsap County. For over 20 years, he's ensured that this community has a place to call home, whether it was a picnic, a monthly dinner, or a bingo game at the youth center, a pop-up club night, or the large now yearly celebration that Kids at Pride has become. Uh, and uh, the first Pride celebration was in the mid-1990s. Uh, it, was, it was a potluck. Uh, now they just take over a whole park. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see. He has uh, been involved in helping to organize what became this tradition. He has worked with both Out Kitsap and Kitsap HIV AIDS Foundation. He helped create new and essential resources, including an L LGBTQ plus focused youth center, fun social events like a prom for those who weren't able to attend theirs with their partner of choice. Uh, he has a community dinner bingo nights known as Friday Feast and Queer Bingo and the Kitsap AIDS Walk. Uh, he has just been instrumental in so many things. And, and I think 
I don't know, I met you years ago. And and um, it seems like no matter where we where we go, if it's related to social justice, Michael is there. So thank you so much for your work in our community. got so involved I forgot the certificate and our third um, award winner this year is Peggy Erickson former co-chair of the Council for Human Rights. She uh, co-chaired with Tracy Flood, who was, who was our moderator. And under their leadership, they built and strengthened relationships with Kitsap organizations who are doing human rights work. They, uh, Peg, it was Peggy's idea to start the social meet and greet, um, which was successful last year and this year. Uh, was twice as big and almost and um, it looks like if we continue this it's going to be in a new location <laughs> it was so successful she has collaborated with NAACP civil survival surge living life leadership PYA Kitsap Immigration Assistance Center P flag care she's worked with law enforcement organizations and others to present forums to educate the public on important human rights issues. And um, she's done extensive anti-racism community organizing and uh, has presented workshops and hosted conversations around Kitsap County and beyond. She's a volunteer for the People's Institute Northwest, um, which also pre presents um, anti-racism forums and um, until recently she also published the Kitsap Social Justice Network which was a monthly newsletter and um, she has just introduced me to so many people <laughs> it's just wonderful and I'll say oh you know we're looking for a speaker about such and such and oh have you tried you know she's just a wonderful font of, of information and making connections with our community. So thank you, Peggy, very much. <laughs>